You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Nothing makes me feel as old as remembering when I used to go downtown to purchase compact discs. It's not the CDs that make me feel this old. It's the places where I purchased them. When I was a teenager, or even in my early 20s, within a few minutes' walk from the center of Toronto, there were at least two HMV record stores, including the flagship store, two Sam the Record Man stores, again, including the flagship store, the flagship store of Tower Records, and a giant Sunrise Records. Now here, I'm not even counting the many independent music shops or the used CD stores, all of which tended to have smaller places on nearby side streets. Those stores, I probably don't have to tell you, are all gone now. If you had a favorite music store in a mall near you as a teen, it's probably gone too. Unless that store was a Sunrise Records. While every other major music chain in Canada or every other foreign retailer that set up shop here has seen their stores either vanish one by one or disappear all at once when the company goes under, Sunrise Records endures. And endures doesn't cover it. The chain has been growing, expanding across the country, adding dozens of stores. In fact, some of the last remaining HMV outlets in Canada became Sunrise Record Shops. So, how? How in an age of music streaming, of music industry-wide revenue claps, and the death of physical media, and even the death of so much of physical retail in general, how does Sunrise Records keep growing? How exactly did they become Canada's last record store chain still standing? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Richard Trapunsky is the digital editor at Billboard.ca. He is a music journalist, and he wrote about the remarkable story of Sunrise in The Walrus. Hey, Richard. Hey, Jordan. How you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks for coming back on the show. Of course, thanks for having me. Why don't we start with the end of the last era that brought us uh, to where we currently are to sort of set the stage. I remember uh, I spent my teen years in downtown Toronto uh, bouncing basically between HMV and Sam the Record Man and Sunrise Records and Tower Records and... Uh, now there's nothing down there except for maybe one tiny HMV in a basement somewhere. When and how did all of the music stores vanish? Tell us about that seismic shift. Sure. I mean, I think, as anyone knows, the music industry went through a pretty big overhaul. You could trace it back to a whole lot of different times, but, you know, you could probably start this discussion in, in the late 90s, early 2000s with the rise of Napster and file sharing, the first sort of big disruption. Uh, not first, but the the First, in this modern era of, of recent disruptions in the music industry, uh, I'm a millennial, so it's one I remember really well. You know, I, I grew up uh, downloading songs from Napster. I mean, I also grew up uh, going to lots of record stores in those days. You know, I went to high school at Northern near Young and Eglinton, and there was a whole bunch of record chains right there. There was, uh, you know, Ed's Record World. I think there was an HMV in there, and there was a used record store called Vortex. Sadly, they're all gone now, uh, as are many others. There used to be, you know, if you walk down Young and Dundas, there were a ton of record stores. Those were the big, flashy Sam the Record Man, HMV. You know, in the earlier days, there were chains like a a Records. And yeah, they all slowly kind of disappeared. There have been a lot of stories in the last 10 years or so about the vinyl revival, which I think we're going to talk about, which has mainly happened at you know, boutique record stores, one-off stores right. that are offering a very specific experience for, for people who, who want that specific vinyl experience. What you don't hear about as much are the chains, the in-between, you know, the stores you'll find in malls, the places where I would have been going in, in high school 
Yeah, the places where you could go to get basically any record that was out on CD. Exactly, yeah, or especially any of the big records. CD or even before that, cassette, uh, slightly before my time. But I remember the days where you'd have cassette and CDs next to each other on the racks. That was probably my earliest record buying experience. But yeah, uh, you don't hear as much about those stores anymore. And a lot of that is because, you know, for the most part, they don't exist. But there is one big exception, which is Sunrise Records. Do we have any idea, before we talk about Sunrise Records, of how many of these stores vanished or how far the revenue or or amount of people buying physical music dropped off? Well, I wouldn't say actually that people are not still buying physical music. We we have the stats. You know, I'm at Billboard now and the company that, that puts together the charts for Billboard is called Illuminate. And every year they put together a year-end report on the music industry and music industry trends. And, you know, one of the trends that they find is, is in vinyl. And not to jump ahead, but a lot of the, the people who are still buying vinyl are not necessarily, you know, older people who still have their record player and are buying albums by, you know, the Beatles or, you know, <laughs> you know classic rock bands. A lot of them are, are Gen Z and are young listeners. And one of the most popular, in fact, by far the most popular artist on vinyl is Taylor Swift. We actually at Billboard, we just got some exclusive Canadian data for from 2023 on the top 10 vinyl sales in Canada. I'm going to guess she's like four of them. She is four of them, exactly. And she's the top three. Okay. And number four is Olivia Rodrigo. And then when you get to number five, then you find Pink Floyd. But, you know, you'd expect Pink Floyd, Fleetwood Mac, but a lot of it is are these sort of Gen Z pop stars who've really, you know, they've got this huge devoted fan base who will go and buy anything. <laughs> For Taylor Swift could put out anything and her fans will will put it to the top of the charts. And in fact, she has been re-releasing every album and they have all ended up back at the top of the charts. In a little bit, we can talk about who buys what and where and how that changes how these remaining stores do business. But because you've already mentioned them, and that's really uh, the crux of what I find so fascinating about this discussion, Sunrise Records, formerly one of those four that I mentioned that were kind of in the malls, um, on the streets, you know, competing with HMV and Sam's and, and all those. How close did Sunrise come to joining the HMVs and Towers and Sam the Record Mans of the world? Well, it pretty much almost happened, actually. The chain was really struggling. It was sort of like the last one that was kind of hanging on. HMV was still around, but the record stores didn't have the capital that they once did, let's say. And its savior, which I think we're going to talk about, is a, a man named Doug Putman. At the time, he was 30 years old, a 30-year-old businessman. He saw... Sunrise was was sort of flailing and it was up for sale and he took a chance and he bought the whole chain. And then in 2017, you know, one of the the other big chains, its big rival HMV was also struggling. It it entered receivership and you know, announced it was going to close all its stores and Putman then bought all of those stores. He didn't buy the there there's sort of a distinction to be made. He didn't buy HMV the chain, but he bought all the stores and he turned them all into Sunrise Records, most of them at malls throughout Canada. It it becomes a little tricky because he actually then more recently did buy the chain HMV in the UK and is running those as HMVs. But in Canada, HMV is done, and those are Sunrise Records now. Tell me about Putman, because this is like something he does, right? Who is he? What's his approach to business in general? He's a really interesting guy. I, I I had a conversation with him about this and about his strategy in general. You know, I think when you hear about a company that is struggling, especially with lots of locations like that, uh, and you hear about a company that's going to, you know, or a businessman that's going to come in and buy it and make it profitable and sort of reduce a lot of the waste and consolidate and et cetera, that's a very specific strategy uh, of venture capital a lot of the time. We, we talked a bit of the piece about, you know, how that's often called vulture capitalism, because, you know, it'll be people who will buy a beloved brand to, to milk any worth that's left of it and then flip it for a profit. Right. That's not what, what Putman's doing. He, he bought um, Sunrise Records because he's a music fan and he thought, you know what, I think that, that the death of music is, is overrated. 
I don't I think there is life still left in this. And yeah, he has a habit of of buying these. He called them distressed businesses, distressed turnaround. He bought Toys R Us and he owns Toys R Us in Canada. And then more recently, he bought Bed Bath and Beyond in Canada. He launched a new brand off of that called Rooms and Spaces. And he also bought a whole bunch of during the pandemic. David's Tea was a struggling franchise. Uh, and he bought a lot of those David's Tea locations and malls and launched a new brand called Tea Kettle. So he really has a, a history of doing this. What did he tell you about why he likes to do that? I mean, he you talked to him, he said he just, he likes it, essentially. You know, we talked about the, the strategy that a lot of people have of, of buying brands to fix them up and sell them at a profit. He, he tells me he's never sold anything. He actually buys them to turn them around and then run them as a company because, you know, he sees value left in, in those retail brands. Sunrise specifically, you know, he's, he's a music fan. He, he was very involved in Record Store Day and the launch of Record Store Day and continuing Record Store Day in Canada, uh, which, you know, is a day every year that's designed to celebrate brick and mortar record stores. And it comes with a lot of exclusive records and people will line up, collectors will line up for that. So, you know, he, he's interested in records, although he said he's not like a super, you know, high fidelity record, record geek. But, you know, it's kind of like an old school uh, approach to business that you don't see as often anymore. He's doing it out of love. He's also, you know, he's still a businessman. He is still at the end of the day, trying to make money from it. But he, you know, it's, it's an approach that you don't often see as much these days. So what specifically did he see in Sunrise and in potentially owning more physical music stores. And I guess the side version of that question is, what did he think was wrong with those stores that they weren't working that he could fix? Yeah, that was one of the things, right? Is you did hear a lot, especially at that time about doom and gloom. We're talking about a decade ago, that was the rise of streaming as the, um, you know, the big model of distribution for music Spotify started to rise and took over and Apple Music and similar platforms like that, where, you know, rather than you have to go out to the record store to buy the new album from Taylor Swift or whoever, you can just go on Spotify and listen to it the minute that it comes out and everyone can have that collective experience. And so I think a lot of experts saw that and thought, okay, well, it's been a nice run. Record stores are done now. And he saw it and he said, well, no, you know, people still want to own their music. and there is still a market for that. And, you know, there's some community to going to stores. I think that's where you've seen a lot of the the smaller boutique and indie shops are really built around that community. And Sunrise Records is a lot more utilitarian. It's in it's in the um the malls and, and whatnot. But, you know, there is still that that aspect of going in and browsing and, and finding what you want. And, you know, I think that the proof has worn out. People are still buying records and people are still buying CDs. CDs have not died out. It's surprising to hear, maybe just for someone like me who does stream extensively, that CDs are still a massive part of this because I did understand and was prepared to talk about the resurgence of vinyl. Why don't CDs get enough credit for the fact that they're still hanging on? Why does everybody who doesn't use them just assume that nobody else does? Well, I mean, they're not, they're definitely not the, the sexiest of, of music formats. I think you would say, um, you know, I had a ton of CDs and I don't really, my, my computer doesn't even have a CD drive anymore, sadly. I can't play a CD in my house right now if you gave me one. There's nothing for me to play it on. Exactly. But if you want to have a record in your physical collection, you're either going to buy it on vinyl or you'll probably buy it on CD. There's also been a mini cassette revival, but I don't think that's something we want to talk about here. Um, you know, there's some surprisingness to it. People who are buying CDs are not all millennials. You'll actually find, you know, newer artists still putting out CDs. But one of the interesting threads that I found while talking to a couple of managers at specific Sunrise stores is the rise of K-pop as a genre, Korean pop. A lot of those artists are putting out collectible releases on CD and even, you know, mini disc, mini CD. There's a, a K-pop girl group called Red Velvet that put out their album on mini CD and they sold those at Sunrise. And 
probably the uh, the listeners of those records are way too young to have ever had a mini disc player. That was a format that didn't last very long, but I think to them it probably seems kind of retro and kind of cool. Whereas, you know, for us, it's just something that we remember, but it's still happening. You know, there are young listeners where if they're the, you know, their artist puts out a release in any format and it's cool and you can collect it, you know, maybe it's a, an interesting color, or an interesting format. Maybe it has a couple of different B-sides or something. They'll go and they'll buy it. This gets to a point that you make in your piece in The Walrus uh, from talking to Sunrise managers that I found really interesting. You write that, you know, as part of a different strategy from how they used to exist, Sunrise has to be uh, very intentional now about what they buy, where they sell it, and how. Can you describe their inventory process and how they choose what to sell where? Yes, definitely. Sunrise Records now has a huge chain. You know, there's actually more locations of Sunrise now than there were in its heyday. There's 85 stores throughout the country. And it was once, you know, just an Ontario-based chain. Now it's all over the country. And, you know, a lot of them are in malls. And a lot of those stores have specific demographics. Because they are such a big chain and they have like a, a consolidated head office, they can look at retail trends and they can, you know, on a wider scale, they can see what are the big albums, you know, being sold on vinyl throughout the world, throughout Canada. But then they can also zero in on specific stores. You know, what's the top selling album at the store in Surrey or in Windsor? You know, what genres are doing well? Who's listening to country music? You know, who's into K-pop? And, you know, they are paying a lot of attention to that and, and deciding which inventory goes where. And yeah, that's that's a big part of their of their strategy now is we're, we're talking about something that people are really attached to going out and buying physical music. We're also talking about a big chain where they can use some of those economies of scale. They can use some of that data and they can be really intentional about what they're selling and, and how it gets inventoried. I wanted to ask about the initial reactions to Putman's purchase of the chain and uh, what he planned to do with it versus uh, what people in the industry are saying about him now. Did it seem crazy when he did it or what What was the actual perception of the move? I mean, I think it did seem crazy, right? Anytime that a large category of, of retail stores or of anything is closing and, you know, it's being disrupted, to use that buzzword, for somebody to come in and, and say, no, well, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to open record stores. I'm going to open them in malls. I'm going to focus on physical product. Yeah, of course, you know, business people are going to say, what, what are you doing? <laughs> What's happening? And it's been about 10 years. So you have 10 years to draw and you could see that the, the chain has expanded, you know, and that the data is, is saying that people are still buying records and buying CDs. You know, there's some, there's some vindication there for sure. How big are we talking now? You mentioned 85 stores, but just in terms of like, the geographical footprint of the company and also, you know, how many jobs are we talking about here? Because again, uh, those are the kind of jobs that don't really exist in many places anymore. Um, now that so much of media is just available to stream online, you know, where you get the the stereotypical image of the like snobby record store teen who points you to the new cool thing that you might love. Yeah, I think that a lot of people you know, I'm a music writer, right? I work in music. I know a ton of people who, you know, had their first job or got their, their feet wet in, in music by working at an HMV or working at a Sunrise Records in a mall, you know, they would take a chance and hire a teen. Then there were stores like, you know, Sonic Boom before it moved to Spadina. I remember, I feel like I dropped off a resume there in my day and they said, well, you know, everyone here works, everyone who works here is in a band. Yeah. You're just not cool enough. You're not cool enough. Exactly. But yeah, there, the, that experience still exists. I think you hear about these stores where it's an outdated reference now, but high fidelity, you know, the Jack Black and John Cusack working at the record store and, and judging your tastes and, you know, not wanting to sell you a, a specific Stevie Wonder record because it's when he went commercial or something. That stereotype still exists. It's, you know, you, you hear about that when you're talking about the boutique indie vinyl stores. Like I said, Sunrise is a, is a lot more populist, I would say. There's 500 jobs, they've told me. It's not a public company, so you don't. a lot of their data is not available. We don't actually, as I'm talking about the success, a lot of the evidence is just how many stores they have, 
and its expansion because, you know, I asked for numbers and they said, well, that's, we're a private company. We don't. The evidence is that like, we're still here and they're not. (laughs) Exactly. But there are 500 employees that they did tell me. And those are jobs that, that still exist. A, a lot of those people, Robert Lawson is, is the manager that I spoke to from their store in Cloverdale Mall. And he has been working there and in record stores since the 80s. He's been working there for, I think, about a decade and a half. So that's kind of an, another exception. He, he knows all the people who've been coming in there. That's, that's one of the longer standing Sunrise Record stores. But there are a lot of jobs and, you know, people are still coming. The last thing I want to ask you is, again, about what Sunrise does that other companies in this business didn't necessarily do. And uh, as you put it in your piece, there is a lesson here for other physical media retailers like Indigo uh, in terms of what happened to a place like HMV. Can you just kind of explain the differing points of focus that those two businesses had? Yeah, HMV didn't survive. One of the people that I talked to in the story is named Barbie Bullock. She's a, a district manager for Ontario for Sunrise. So she gave me a lot of the, the trends and talked about the merchandising and stuff like that. She actually was a manager at HMV. So when Putman bought HMV and he turned those stores into Sunrise Records, he actually retained a whole lot of the staff from HMV. And she's one of the, the staff that, that came over from HMV into Sunrise. And so, you know, I asked her, why do you think Sunrise has thrived and HMV has failed. And she told me, well, first of all, they didn't, they didn't see the vinyl revival happening. I think they started to realize it and then it was too late. Those late days of HMV, I'm sure you probably went to the one at Yagan Dundas, the flagship. You'd go in and yeah, there'd be some CDs, there'd be some records, DVDs, et cetera. But you know, you'd also see a lot of you know, blankets, housewares, lifestyle products, everything but music and you know, I think that's something you're seeing at stores like Indigo now. Yes, it's a bookstore and books are the main product, but you go in and look around and probably what you're going to see before that are, you know, socks. You're going to see, yeah, a lot of blankets, candles, all of this kind of stuff. And actually records as well. There, there's vinyl being sold at Indigo and at stores like Urban Outfitters. Urban Outfitters is, is you know, one of the major vinyl retailers these days, as is Walmart. It's an interesting discussion, I think, because, yeah, that's what she said, is that HMV lost track of its core product, and that's something that's happening to Indigo. At the same time, a big part of the story that we haven't discussed yet of Sunrise is also things like collectibles. You know, we're looking at vinyl and CDs as a product to own. So are T-shirts. So are, you know, lunchboxes and Funko Pops, which are those, you know, big head collectible figures that you can get for like any pop culture product. You'll see, you know, every Marvel super superhero, you'll see the Ramones, you'll see, you know, even probably like, you can get obscure, I don't know, like Maddie Matheson maybe has one. But yeah, those things are huge. And one other chain that Putman bought, which I forgot to mention, is called FYE, For Your Entertainment. That's a big chain that exists in the US and he's bringing it very slowly to Canada and actually in in the Eden Center in Toronto one of the big malls there is no Sunrise Records there was once but there isn't it's actually an FYE store and it's similar to Sunrise they sell a lot of albums but their main core product is those collectibles and those pop culture things and one of the things we talked about were a lot of the people buying there where we're talking about a lot of Gen Z listeners still collecting music a lot of those collectibles that are being sold you know, G.I. Joes and, and whatnot, Pokemon cards are being sold to, to millennials like me who are now in their mid-late 30s and, and have some disposable income and have a lot of nostalgia. We're a very nostalgic generation, you know, we're the BuzzFeed quiz generation. And now we have some disposable income to go out to FYE and, and buy those things. It's interesting because, uh, as I mentioned, I don't buy physical music anymore, but I would buy, if there was a place to get them that was convenient, uh, band t-shirts and merch, which is what you you miss when you don't have uh, all those music stores around. So uh, I guess I got to go uh, find my local Sunrise Records. Yeah, maybe. But you could also buy it at a show. That's true. I went to one show last year. We're hoping for many, many more this year. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you. Richard Trapansky, writing In the Walrus. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. 
If you want to give us some feedback about this episode or any other episode, you can do it by emailing us hello at the big story podcast.ca or by leaving a voicemail 416 935 5935. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of this podcast. Robin Simon is also a producer on the show. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Sound design this week was done by Christian Prohome. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. The show is produced by all of us here at Frequency Podcast Network, which is a division of Rogers. And I am your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath Rawlings. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend. Preserve your copies of physical media, and we'll talk Monday.